Now we would like to introduce Lynn Evans, who's the mother of two boys um, with pectus excavatum, and who's written a book on um, patient testimonials um, in pectus excavatum. So it would be great to get the patient's view on all of this. Good afternoon. My name is Lynn Evans. I am a mum to three children, two of whom have been diagnosed in the last two years with pectus conditions. I am also the founder of a life writing business called The Memory Shed, and I am the co-author of the book, which I shall hold up for you, uh, Pectus and Me. In the next 15 minutes, I would like to share a remarkable story with you, a story that has involved the coming together of 41 pectus patients and their families, who through our collective voice and emotive storytelling have helped to get pectus treatment recommissioned on NHS England for the most severe cases. Treatment had been decommissioned in, 2018, in 2019. I shall start the story with a little bit about me. Nearly three years ago, my late father was diagnosed with bladder cancer. One of my lifelong ambitions had been to write a book. And having recently been made redundant, I set about writing my father's life story. I feel privileged I had the time to do so and grateful for the fact I did. Four months into treatment, he lost his mind due to chemotherapy, we believe, and developed a rapidly progressive form of dementia. He found me reading the words of his own life story, hugely cathartic at a time that he was struggling with his own memory. The impact of that experience was so profound, I made the decision to set up a life writing business called The Memory Shed, helping others to recollect, write, and preserve their life stories for themselves and their families. At about the same time, my 14-year-old son mentioned one day, he said, Mum, I think my chest is growing inwards. And in comparing his chest with his 10-year-old brothers, I realized that whilst indeed his chest was growing inwards, his brother's was growing outwards. I was to discover that they both had pectus conditions, excavatum and carinatum. And my mind immediately raced back to my dad's life story. He had mentioned that his father had a peculiar pigeon-shaped chest. Pectus was in our family, but it had skipped three generations. My dad went to his grave, none the wiser, before we re received their diagnosis. What I didn't expect to discover was that treatment for pectus conditions had been decommissioned in 2019 by NHS England. Our own GP dismissed the condition as cosmetic, and I felt utterly bewildered by the absence of a treatment pathway. Feeling abandoned by NHS England, I turned to Facebook. There, I found the most incredible community of people, over 2,000 of them, in fact, Parents and patients who, like me, were finding themselves in a quagmire of misinformation. Dead-end corridors, contradictions, nearly all of whom had been told that NHS England had shut its doors on them. Meanwhile, patients in the devolved nations were continuing to receive treatment. Through the group, I discovered that one cardiothoracic surgeon, Mr Gerald Dunning, who is going to be speaking next, was doing his very best to support patients, both surgically, with patients paying for time in the theatre, and also offering non-surgical treatment uh, through the use of vacuum bells and bracing. Uh, Joe was based up at James Cook University Hospital in Middlesbrough. We were in Buckinghamshire, but we're very grateful he took us under his care, and the boys are now both being treated non-surgically. But I was also to learn that many other patients across the UK were making pilgrimages, that is how I define it, up north, from as far away as Cornwall. Others, however, were having to fund private treatment at a cost of between £5,000 for bracing and up to £23,000 for nurse surgery. Many were turning to crowdfunding to raise the money and organising cake sales, um, sponsorship charity events and it was simply unfathomable that patients should be faced with this predicament on top of managing the debilitating side effects of a life-changing condition. 
A post appeared on the Facebook Pectus group back in mid-November 2022 to advise that a Pectus best practice event would be taking place at the Royal College of Surgeons in February. We had a pre-meeting on Zoom, and this was really an opportunity for clinicians and patients to talk about some of the challenges that they were facing. Um, and what we were hearing, you know, it was very consistent how people were grappling with the system, and it wasn't just heartbreaking, it was actually utterly shocking. I came off the call and I emailed the past president of the um, SCTS, uh, the Cardiothoracic Society, and suggested that maybe it would be an idea to produce a book. I was setting up my writing business at the time, and I knew that I would be equipped to help them. And thankfully, he bought into the idea. In the course of four weeks, 41 patients and families signed up to tell their stories. I was utterly staggered by the response and it clearly showed the desperation of these families to share their journeys. 100 copies of the book were printed for the event, capturing over 40,000 words, 200 pages of hard-hitting personal stories from children, young adults, midlifers, the majority with PE, some with PC, all opening up their hearts and experiences of what they'd been living with day to day. This book was sent far and wide to key stakeholders in the NHS, NHS commissioning, professional societies, and the Royal Colleges, uh, surgical and paediatric. We simply do not have time to review all the stories with you today, but I would absolutely urge you to read the book yourselves it is now available as an e-book on the Society for Cardiothoracic Surgery website. Look under the section uh, Lungs and then Patients, and it is also available under the Bespoke section on my website. What I found most incredible was the consistency in what was being shared by the patients. Nearly everyone is being told by their doctors that treatment was no longer available because it is a cosmetic condition. As the co-author of 41 stories in the book, I can tell you that in order of impact, pectus conditions are causing, number one, severe physiological conditions, two, uh, quite devastating in some instances, mental health issues, and cosmetic was kind of coming in three on the list. The reality is that many patients of pectus are being severely physically impacted by the deformities to their bodies. They talk in volumes of feeling as though their chests are being crushed, that air is being squeezed out of their lungs. They are consistently suffering from heart palpitations, chest pains, restlessness, breathlessness, sleep apnea, syncope fatigue, and racing hearts. And these people are being unnecessarily referred to cardio consultants and are being investigated for heart problems. They're being sent to respiratory consultants to identify why they are struggling to breathe. Just imagine if you only had two centimetres of space between your sternum and spine. It isn't difficult to appreciate that lungs and hearts cease to function properly when they don't have a normal cavity to operate within. Pectus and me and the impact of sharing our stories in person on February the 2nd did help to sway opinion. And in April this year, NHS England agreed to recommission treatment, treatment for the most severe patients. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this once we've heard from some of the stories. So I'm going to share four stories with you. Um, the first is the story of a little girl called Mia. Um, I'm going to actually read you a short excerpt from her story. Um, she's a 10-year-old girl who has had one of the most severe cases of PE that Joel has ever seen. Her, the Haller index, as you know, is a measure of the dip, and 3.5 is classified as severe. Mia's Haller index was 20. Um, she has a one centimetre gap between her sternum and spine and her family are currently awaiting treatment and have previously been exploring taking her up to Scotland to be operated on, such as the severity of her condition. I quote, the last, this is her mother, the last 18 months have been a struggle for my daughter. The syncope episodes have become so frequent that she has been terrified to leave the house in case she collapses. 
I have struggled to get her to go to school and her attendance has dropped drastically. Through the support of school staff, we have managed to get her back into school, but she still suffers with severe anxiety and only leaves the house to attend school. In November, we travelled to Glasgow to have an echocardiogram, uh, CPET, and to see the chest wall surgeon, Dr. Carl Davis. After her echocardiogram, we were told her right ventricle is severely compressed because of the severity of her PE. My daughter's health is severely affected. I am now having to use a wheelchair to collect her from school as she has synco episodes just on the walk home. She no longer socialises with any of her friends, will not participate in any family events that involve leaving the house. The PE is not only affecting her physical health, but her mental health. She suffers with anxiety and depression as she is unable to do what her friends do. And she obviously knows that her body um, looks different to other girls. Sorry, I should have changed over the slides there. Um, it, nobody in England who is requiring, um, you know, to, the, the need to use a wheelchair um, is, is really quite staggering and nobody should be forced to go to Scotland for treatment. Our next, uh, our next story is um, a boy called Bobby. Bobby is 15. He also has severe PE. Um, and he is now currently undergoing a whole series of tests to see whether he will qualify for the new MDT pathway. Um, and this is his mother telling his story. Hi, I'm Becky. I'm mum of Bobby. He's 15 with a severe pectus excavatum, if not very severe. His halor index is six and his pectus causes scoliosis. He's got rib flare. He's got heart and lung compression on scan. He suffers with trouble swallowing. He can't maintain or struggles to put on weight. He gets acid reflux and indigestion. Uh, he can't eat big meals or big mouthfuls, anything too dry or too bulky. He struggles with breathlessness, extreme fatigue. Uh, this interrupts his sleeping. This inhibits him from keeping up with his, his peers. He likes to play football, but he can't play a full game. The pectus also impacts on him mentally as he's had to do a lot of work around his self-esteem because he didn't want to at first show his pectus. This w worried him when he was swimming. Some of the shirts that he wore, some of the clothes he wore, to, chose to wear, showed his pectus and showed his rib flare. Um, he's had, had lots of hospital visits over the years, uh, lots of scans and tests and investigations. This has impacted us as a family because we've got another child, the younger son called Billy, who doesn't quite understand the amount of time and, and, and attention needed to, to look after a kid with pectus. Um, we are currently awaiting assessment on the very severe pathway to see if we qualify for surgery. This would make a massive difference to our lives, lives not only Bobby's lives, but the whole family. It means we, we can do more, we can achieve more, we can have nicer days out without having to plan around Bobby's fatigue and Bobby's breathlessness. And it really would make a huge difference to our lives. Okay, quite powerful stuff, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, our next two stories are examples of how surgery can make a hugely positive difference to patients' lives. First up is Ellie. Ellie is 27 years old, uh, born with um, severe PE, and she also has Marfan syndrome. Um, she had a particularly severe case of, of PE with only 1.7 centimetres between her sternum and spine. And Ellie was actually fortunate in that she was able to be operated on in 2018, just before treatment got decommissioned. And this is her story. I'm Ellie, I'm 27, and I have Marfan syndrome. I started presenting with pectus excavatum from a very young age, but things started deteriorating very rapidly in my late teens and early 20s when I started experiencing very frightening episodes where my chest would collapse in very suddenly. By the time I was 22, which was 2018, 
my health was so poor and so affected by my pectus excavatum that I was confined to my flat. I couldn't walk any distance and so was unable to attend university, unable to go and get my shopping, unable to spend time with friends or family. I knew after I'd finished my degree, I wouldn't be able to go into work. I'd have to return home to be cared for by my parents. At this point, I reached out to Joel Dunning and I had the NUS procedure at James Cook University Hospital in October 2018. At the time of the surgery, my HALA index was 11 and a half and I had 1.7 centimetres between my sternum and my spine. Joel Dunning inserted three NUS bars and I remember after surgery him telling me and my family how lucky I was to have had the surgery when I did and I still, still believe that. Since having surgery, I'm a totally different person. Currently, I'm working full time. I am able to do things that I was never able to do before. Um, I go running at the gym, I go for walks in the lakes, and most importantly for me, I'm able to live independently from my family. That was it. A really positive story there. Um, and our final story that I will share again is um, a 25 year old with, she had severe PE, Kate. Um, what she doesn't say in her story, she tells the story in the book, it doesn't come through on the video, which she was having severe fainting episodes from the age of 13. Uh, once uh, the, the, the episode that prompted her parents to really seek treatment was she collapsed in boots and actually uh, knocked herself out and ended up in A&E. Um, she has, she's one of the first to have been able to access surgery on the new pathway and had a Ravitch procedure last year. Not last year, we're still in 2023, aren't we, this year? <laughs> I think you'll agree that's a really, really uplifting uh, testimony to the benefits of, of surgery. So where are we up to in our story? I've mentioned the new MDT pathway was uh, put in place from April 2023 for the most severe conditions. There's quite a strict set of criteria. I'm not going to, I'm not medically trained to go into it. Joe will touch on it. Um, but it, we see it as a huge positive that at least for those with most severe pectus, they now have a, a pathway available. And the first treatment centre opened up in St. Bart's. Um, the, the, the only downside with it at the moment is uh, it is only providing provision for adults and not children. Um, but we are, the NHS is looking to open a second centre in the north in, early in 2024 and there will be paediatric provision um, attached to this. But the story doesn't end there. I think for me, one of the really key things we need to do is educate. Um, I'm still on the Facebook group and consistently, at least every two weeks, there's more people coming on saying that they've been turned away from GPs, it's cosmetic, the utter frustration. Um, how do we get that message out there? We really need to look at how we commu communicate that new pathway. And I think also we need to recognise the benefit that non-surgical routes can provide, particularly in mitigating the need for surgery. Um, and I think looking at how we can maybe introduce centres around the country where people can go and get vacuum bell um, and bracing treatments. Um, and on a positive note as well, I mean, we've, we're, we're on a journey. Um, but uh, 
a number of us who were um, uh, work together in getting the book produced are now in the process of setting up the first UK Pectus charity. Um, the application is going in next week and I hope to be able to share more information on that soon. But I really appreciate having the opportunity to talk today um, and if there is a takeout, um, firstly please do share our stories, share the learning, read the book and also remember uh, that pectus can cause shortness of breath. Uh, that's the medical takeout. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lynn, and thank you for all your advocacy for this patient group. Um, and let's hope we can try to move forward for paediatric patients. Um, and um, well done for setting up your charity, and we wish you all the best of luck um, for that.